places of worship may reopen subject to strict restrictions which are absolutely necessary if we are to prevent infections from rising in accordance with norms and standards that will be set out in the regulations all ye all ye faithful hello guys yes yes the faithful the believers may gather and the churches have won they have been lobbying they have been begging they have been angry and they finally got in their way so we had a family meeting over the weekend where president soldama paused our destination about what's going to happen with lockdown level three and in this address he then says you know he'll come back to us about the churches so on tuesday he did and you know i remember speaking to i think reverend kenneth mesh of the acdp and it's like oh we're getting a country that's becoming anti-christian the nc must never come to churches and try and campaign for elections so they were really really angry now they got their way but of course only 50 may gather because those regulations the prohibition of large gatherings is still the order of the day churches synagogues mosques temples and other recognized places of worship may resume services but these will be limited in size to 50 people or less depending on the space available social distancing will have to be observed and all worshipers and participants will have to wear face masks in line with the current regulations then we had one Sara suddenly emerging out of nowhere you know who one Sara is <laughs> this guy i want to really make a plea to religious leaders do not open your places you claim to occupy the high moral standard you are the ones who should be saying your members should not come to church we pray in the EFF we support church members of the EFF supporters of the EFF do not go to church that's right the EFS Commander-in-Chief, Julius Malema, is back on the scene and very angry, very angry, hitting out at government for all manner of things, but ultimately unhappy that the country is moving to level three. In fact, Julius Malema is calling on you and I to stay put, saying that at a time like this, we should defy the state. At a time like this, we should do a stay away, saying that a lot of things happening now are very reminiscent of the apartheid era where young people are the ones expected to go out and fight our elders must stay back at home they must be protected remember the older you are the more vulnerable you are to this pandemic so in that regard young people are expected to come out and about so that's a that's an interesting one you know having malema back in the game he was really really harsh on the president he also had a lot to say around the issue of alcohol and tobacco so he's part of the people who are saying why sell alcohol if you can't sell tobacco products you know and he in a similar light to something he said to me previously about science again saying you must show the scientific evidence used to reach these particular decisions again this reminds me of another politician uh in the da gwen Nguenya, the head of policy speaking about the levels within a level within a level that's been happening so there's a constant revision of the levels level three was revised to allow the churches um and dr nkosa zanadla minizuma also spoke this week ministers have now taken to the nation to elaborate on what these regulations would look like and what they mean and whatnot so we've had a lot of media briefings particularly the national command council's ones being postponed time and memoriam they've kind of explained it was because of the churches that this happened there's a lot about the churches but Malema also saying don't go to church and I think I see that point. I'm also like, ay, 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 ay. if the men of the cloth really do care about people and are of a high moral order and they understand what this pandemic means, I mean, government has tried to explain it to them. Surely, surely, Mfundisi, the right thing to do is to not open those doors. Nobody is forced to go to church. The government has just opened an option and they are very strict and stringent measures that have to be followed. Um, 
when people go to church. So the issue of Professor Glenda Gray, I had hoped would die when I discussed it with Kaya last week. We are now on episode 11 of One More Thing with myself, T.D. Madia. And unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, I think I'm going to look at it in a positive light. We have to revisit the Professor Glenda Gray topic. But this time around, I'm going to discuss it with Adrian Basson, the editor-in-chief of News24. I think News24 has taken a lot of flack. In some regards, I think rightfully so, mind you. In other regards, I think, hey, social media is just severe. It's just harsh. But we talk about that. We talk about it. Adrian joins me now to discuss the pandemic, to discuss covering the pandemic, and of course, Professor Glenda Gray and News 24's approach to that story. All right, so as a journalist, I think one generally wants to dominate headlines. You want to set the agenda, you want to lead the story. You don't want to trend for the wrong reasons or be attacked for your work. But ultimately, you don't want to be the story. And sometimes that is what happens. And that's the conversation we're going to have today with my boss, who joins us now. Adrian Basson is the editor-in-chief at News24. Hello, AB, how are you doing? Hello, Chidi. It's so lovely to hear your voice again. Uh, social distancing, but doing fine. <laughs> I miss you all so much. I can't explain how much I miss my colleagues. I didn't expect to miss so many people this way. It's those coffee bar meetings and chats in the hallway and the the jokes in between deadlines. That's the stuff that, that I miss most. Yeah, absolutely. Adrian, I've got to commend Media24. I know people will be like, ah, oh, TD, come on. But honestly, Media24 kind of went into a lockdown before the lockdown. We took to it like fish to water. What was that? Like, just talk us through the thinking around, this is what we're going to do for our employees moving forward in the middle of this crisis. This thing came so fast, TD. I remember in um, on the 5th of March, I was in a, in a strategy meeting for one of our sites. I think it was uh, Wheels24. And and someone just came into the room, uh, our colleague Kate Henry, and said, South Africa has its first coronavirus case. And you kind of knew things weren't going to be the same, but not to the extent that, that they are right now, two months, almost three months later. I'm, I'm extremely uh, proud of, of the way our company has handled this. I think it's been handled clearly. The, the communication has been transparent. And yeah, from the beginning, the focus was on the safety aspect. Obviously, we... Um, as journalists, as reporters, are at the forefront of often dangerous situations. Um, but I think, you know, working from home very quickly was the right decision. And and I'm amazed. I just I just spoke to another colleague now. I'm amazed by how good we have managed to pull this working from home thing off. Of course, I would love to see all of you again, and I hope <laughs> that will happen soon. But um, you know, in in the digital era, I think uh, we've made fully use of of the technology available to, to help us to continue um, our, our real-time coverage of the pandemic in South Africa. I'm always blown at how quickly this has actually developed. I remember when Cyril Ramaphosa, the president, President Ramaphosa made mention of how the country was a candidate. I don't know if you remember that. I was sitting next to you at the South African National Editors Forum's uh, engagement with the president. The Monday, actually, when the first case was reported, that very Monday, the president said, we are a candidate. And by Friday, we had our first case. Editorially, you've also had to make changes. I think about our team politics. I think about the way investigations works. I think about the entertainment division and sports what considerations and what difficulties have been there for you in that space yeah you're right we had to quickly change tact that's one of the reasons why i love all my colleagues so much at news 24 because you're all extremely agile we all just jump in so it was a question of how do we cover this thing from the start let's get to understand the virus i think you you will probably identify with this that I've never read so much health content in my in my life. You know, I never I never thought I'm gonna have to study, uh, you know, viruses and the the difference between a virus and a and a disease and the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic. But see, we had to we had to make a lot of changes. We firstly, like like you said, we're all working from home. So I'm sitting here in my in my bedroom with a makeshift office that I share with my wife and with Wi-Fi that doesn't always work. And and I try to get into a routine of homeschooling with my with my son in the mornings and having uh, you know regular coffee breaks, leg stretches, 
um, trying to also just get out of the door a bit and, and breathe in some fresh air. And I'm sure that that's been important for, for all of us to, to get to, into some personal routine. And then in terms of the work, you know, we continue all our meetings over VC video conference, uh, which is, of course, not that strange for News24. We have uh, our big offices in Joburg and Cape Town. So we're used to seeing our colleagues in Joburg on the screen. And, and we continued with that. Um, and then obviously, you know, watching um, the coverage of this case, um, uh, having our politics team, our investigations team, our news team, all shift their focus to the different aspects of this virus, from the, um, the late night statements from the Minister of Health's office about the new numbers, to understanding what a ventilator is, um, you know, our colleague Carl Cohen getting getting deep into that story and then making sure we're covering the human story clearly because as you know there's a human behind every number and one shouldn't get so obsessed with the numbers that we forget that as well and then the additional dimension of the lockdown and the concomitant economic uh, consequences of people losing their jobs just just in my own circle of friends and parents at school and so on there's there's a number of people and, and in one case a mm. couple that both both lost their jobs in this time Jeez. So, so, you know, having to cover all of this was a massive and is a massive effort, but I am extremely proud of how all of you have taken to it and, and, and just, just, you know, nobody went on leave. Nobody wanted to miss out on this big story. And ultimately, let's be honest, this is the kind of story that journalists live for. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Some days I'm like, well, I've got my own issues with, with COVID. So I don't know. But I agree. I mean, leave was the last thing any of us thought about. We thought about the importance of telling the story. And that's kind of my next pitch, you know, is each and every story that we pick and that comes out on our website what goes into the thinking what is it about particular stories that we choose and pick to communicate to south africans and i think people need to understand that what goes into each and every story that we put out each and every story that we push to people who subscribe to our app i think that's a very good question cd and i think it's important that we talk more about our work and how we do our job to our readers because i think we often assume people understand what journalism is and people understand mm. what journalists do and it's often unfortunate Unfortunately, based on what they see in movies, you know, those large packs of journalists standing outside the courtroom, <laughs> uh, physically assaulting the poor person. We love those movies because we also think, I think journalists <laughs> love those movies because we also think we are those superheroes and we are that cool. But anyway, it's not the reality. Actually, yeah. It's much less glamorous and it's much harder. So let's talk through a day at News24. We, um, we, we wake up in the morning, some earlier than others. We have someone... Um, on the website from 5 a.m. every day, who's looking at the world news that happened overnight while we were asleep, update the site on the world news, update the site on early breaking stories. We have a journalist working from early, looking at things like the traffic, the weather, etc. So we have a political editor, we have news editors, we have sports editor, business editor, entertainment editor, etc. Um, and then all those editors come together at 9.30 every morning um, when we have our diary planning meeting for the day. And at this meeting, we, we're about a group of 15 people. We, we sit um, obviously all over the country now, um, uh, so, some in their pajamas, some, some better dressed. Um, I don't know about you. I try to keep the office, uh, the office look going for a few weeks. Are you and serious? Never. I, un never until, I, until I dropped into, <laughs> into shorts and t-shirts. Um, but then we sit there and we discuss our diaries and we try as a collective to make a decision and, and do a temperature, temperature test of what are the big stories South Africa is talking about. And what I love about our team is it's a diverse team. It's, it's firstly a team dominated by women. And secondly, it's a team that's spread all over the country from all different backgrounds. And, and, and people speak in that meeting and we talk about what the conversation are in their families, in public transport, in their homes, you know, in their, in their circles of friends. So that we are sure we have our finger on the pulse of what, what South Africans are talking about. And in that meeting, we then go through our news diary, through our politics diary, sport, business, entertainment, health, parent, wheels, uh, women's issues, etc. And we decide what are the top stories for the day on our side. So, it is a very open process. We talk about our diaries. Obviously, no day is the same and things change throughout the day. So we are very sure. flexible as well for breaking news. Um, yeah. But then the news editors, as soon as the news breaks, the news editor will speak to the site editor. 
and tell them, listen, uh, the, the, the lockdown system has just changed or whatever the story may be. And then we send those famous push alerts, TD, which, which you referred to, that goes to more than a million mobile phones um, of, of our readers who have chosen to receive them, um, obviously through the News24 app. Um, and those are really stories that, as we call them, move the needle. So in many ways, Absolutely. so that means stories that, that most of our readers will be interested in or that will have an impact on their lives or livelihoods. And, and that's how we make those calls. Obviously, Absolutely. always very subjective and open to failure. The, the last bit is actually the most important thing you've said now. I want to speak about Professor Glenda Gray, the elephant in the room, the difficulty around this particular story that News24 has found itself in, you know. And I must say, before I even ask you questions about it, is that people assume that because we are one entity, we work for all for News24, we all subscribe and believe in the same thing with regards to everything that comes out. And I always say to people, what you don't understand about newsrooms is it's contested terrain. We differ in ideas and thoughts and all sorts of things. So like the public is split on the Professor Glenda Gray issue, so are we. And that's why it was important to talk to Adrian about it. And the importance of the story around Professor Gray standing up and saying, I don't agree with what government is doing. How important was it to tell that story, first of all? Look, see, the, the story had a bit of a, a bit of a history, so let me start there. And I, I don't regard it as an elephant. I am very ha happy to talk about it. I'm very glad to be on your <laughs> show this week to talk about it. I think uh, it's important to firstly look at who she is. I'm not a health re reporter, has never been, and I had to read up on her. So right at the beginning of, of this outbreak, I was told by someone in Zwellim Keyes' office that Professor Glenda Gray is brilliant and that she's almost a de facto deputy to Professor Salim Abdul Karim, she who is, is the chairperson yeah. of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Uh, she's been internationally lauded. Um, we've written a lot about the accolades, so there's no doubt about the fact that she's one of our foremost scientists. We've been pursuing her for an interview because obviously the MIC and their role has been a bit opaque. Nobody's quite sure still what exactly the MIC does, um, what advice they give to Health Minister Zwellim Keys, and what happens to that advice when Minister Keys briefs the National Coronavirus Command Council. I think I, I hope I have that right. <laughs> it's very complicated. Uh, I think you got it right, yeah. And I mean, that was in the quest to find out what the MIC does, how they work, we started to pursue Greg as as the de facto deputy or, or my sec second most senior person um, uh, alongside Professor Karim. Our colleague Azara Karim started to, who's not related to Professor Karim, started to pursue uh, Professor Gray for an interview and after a while she agreed to an interview. And that is what happened. We got an interview with her. Azara conducted the interview. She asked her the hard questions. Professor Gray gave her the honest answers. We recorded the interview. We wrote down the notes. We wrote the story. It was brought to my attention by the news editor that the story is about to be published. And I immediately realized the impact it would have. Here you have someone as senior as Professor Gray in the position she is, fundamentally saying she differs with the with the phased out approach of the lockdown. Now, I think something that got lost in, in, in all the noise it really was a use of the word lockdown. Because I think many of us think of the lockdown done as the phase we're still in. So that is the, the, the levels phase, let's call it that, or the risk-adjusted approach by government. But there are also people who refer to the lockdown only as the hard lockdown, which were the first few weeks. And when she criticized the phased out phase, I think it got lost in that noise that she criticized the entire lockdown, um, which in the first interview, she clarified that she supported the first initial lockdown and that that was actually scientifically sound. Be that as it may, I, I realized the importance of the interview, the fact that it disputes the government's view. We did what, what journalists do. We went to the government for the opinion, to the health department, uh, Popo Macho, the spokesperson. We got their response. We included that in the story. We spoke to Professor Karim, who disagreed with some of the things Gray said. We also went to two more members of the MIC that we got hold of, Professor Mendelssohn and Sam. Uh, we also included their views and, and we published the story and uh, led to a massive fallout between Gray and and the uh, health minister William Keyes. Uh, the rest is history. So Adrian, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm a little bit confused and because um, I didn't get the sense that the fallout or, or the hysteria was around the issue of the lockdown per se, but issues around malnutrition at Baraguanath Hospital. I mean, there was a lot of criticism around that in the piece. So let's let's talk to that matter. So in the piece, uh, Professor Gray said a number of things, and I think it's important yeah, to remember that because a lot of people are only talking about Baraguanath or only talking about regulations. So she's 
She spoke to many things, okay? The biggest criticism, uh, in my view, was the fact that she fundamentally disagreed with the phased-out approach of the lockdown because she said it wasn't scientifically sound. She also criticized government's lockdown approach because she was referring to what she then said was malnutri- uh, uh, severe malnutrition in children uh, for the first time at Chris Harney Baraguanath Hospital. And we published that. And I still say, and I, and, and, and I stand by my view, that coming from someone like her, in her position, with her experience, with the fact that she was actually, she worked in that hospital for many years, we were, we were in our fullest right to publish that statement as part of a bigger interview. After the statement was published, there was obviously people who, who spotted that in the interview and started questioning whether that is in fact the case. Um, we had staff members and, and heads of, of Chris, Bo- Chris Harney Baraguena themselves contradicting that view. And we were then went back to Professor Gray, who said to us, look, she wants to clarify her view. Um, she then clarified the view to say she was referring specifically to early May and, and that there was a rapid increase in early May, and she's still concerned about that. So she she did change her view from the first time ever to the beginning of May, which we then reflected immediately in our story, as soon as that complaint reached us. Um, and as soon as she confirmed to us that she wanted to, cl- to change her view. So so that is really it. We, we have, we've, we've, clarified the view it's obviously disappointing that she got it wrong i still i still feel and 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 my view is is agreed with by professor george class and our public editor that we were entitled to publish what she told us in the interview uh cd as you know every interview we do it's impossible for us to check everything a expert tells us and that was also my argument with professor anton harbour on twitter when he when he questioned that was if we go to you, Professor Harbour, who, who was, who's the head of journalism at FITS, and you tell us that 100 journalists were retrenched in South Africa last year, I will print that because you but, are supposedly the authority on journalism. If you got it wrong, you then, if you got it wrong, we will clarify it and that will obviously, that will impact on, 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 on you. But, but I, I don't see why, why we shouldn't print that. So, so that, was, that was really the crux of that argument. And yeah, I'm glad that there was this debate and this discussion. I think we've all learned from it. Hopefully, you know, enrich the, the public discourse around this. But Adam, it also brings into question, and I think I've heard a lot of people asking this, about Journalism 101, basic principles of journalism, you know. I hear you saying that if an expert makes a comment, the truth of the matter is most of us are likely to take that to be the case because an expert has made it. And and Professor Gray is absolutely that. But one would then go, but don't you give Barra Gwanath Hospital a right to reply? Not to confirm or deny whether or not the cases have spiked, but you go back and you say, Barra, this is supposedly happening. How are you even dealing with it? One would assume that you give Bara a right of reply for it was mentioned in the story. What is the response to that? Yeah, so hindsight is is twenty twenty, and and mm. you know we could have done that. Um, it would have it would have delayed publication of the story, and and we probably, if I have to guess, wouldn't have gotten a quick and and, and answer. We are still waiting at this moment. Uh, we've asked the Gauteng Department of Health a few days ago already for all the stats around malnutrition in the province, and um, we haven't received it. So. Uh, this is not something that a practicing journalist will know you get quickly. Uh, we could have done that CD, but again, I don't, I don't have a fundamental problem with the way we handled this. Um, I think that our colleague was fully within a right to publish that. And again, what a lot of people didn't understand and, and why I get upset about some of the comments on social media is I never said we don't verify facts or tip-offs. There's a big difference between an anonymous mm-hmm. tip-off coming to us at News24 that Barack Gwenov is experiencing severe malnutrition under children and Professor Glenda Gray saying that to us on the record. You know, I think people are facetious if they say, well, I've admitted that we, we don't verify facts. Absolutely not. I mean, we, we, our work speaks for itself. We've, we've done some of the best verification over the past years. In this case, we did an interview. This is one of the things she said. Um, she was wrong. And she clarified her view and, and we published that. If we get a tip off um, at our investigations unit or in our news unit about something going on at the hospital, we will go to that hospital. We will try and find out um, 
difficult as it is to get that kind of data, but we will try our best to find out if indeed this 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 merit to the to the tip of. This um, in this case, um, there was enough reason to believe that Glenda Gray was was knew what she was talking about. She she worked at that hospital at that pediatric unit. She knows the people who work there. But um, she isn't there and, now. And, and I would, yeah. no, sure, she isn't there now. And she was wrong, TV. And, and I will be the first to admit that she was wrong. I, I mean, after her. We, you, you recognize that. You're recognizing that leaders and experts can be wrong. And I think we know that as journalists, that often leaders and experts can be wrong. I think there is a gap in that that is not seen. I'm not sure how it could have been communicated nearly loudly enough. I think I'm going to ask a question that might actually answer that. But that is where I think the gap is. People are not hearing or seeing News24 saying enough that she had been wrong here too. There is an argument, and, and, and this is what I'm looking for comment from you, I suppose. There is an argument that we have raised our voices in defending her right to speak, which is important. It is important to allow alternative voices to be heard, but we are not highlighting the fact that actually she also got some things wrong, that the, 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 the things that have been raised as problematic in what she said are legitimate. I don't know if I'm making any sense. No, you are, and I hear that. I, I do, however, want to want to caution. I think we need to to keep perspective, and we need to mm. to look at things in context. So, if you look at the entire interview, um, the first one we published with with Gray, she probably said around, if I must quickly think out loud, about I, I guess eight to twelve topics that she addressed in that interview. Mm. One of them was was the Barack Obama matter. The other over overarching theme for me still, and I think this got lost as well in the noise, was the fact that she fundamentally disagree with the phasing out strategy of government mm. and the fact that she feels scientists are not being heard. And we saw other scientists backing them backing her up on that afterwards. People like Professor Franz Fente, Professor Shab uh, Shabir Madi has been saying that for a few weeks now. Not yeah, only he had been platform. saying it for a while. Yeah, I remember. So, so I think that's that's for me still the critical part. Obviously, as you know, and as I know, if we write a story with a hundred facts and we get one wrong, that's the one thing people will focus on. Of Unfortunately, course. that's the way that specifically Twitter works. But I'm not going to be dictated by Twitter on, on how we do our work. I think we will we will keep doing our work in alignment with the press council. I think that that in this case, we were very clear when we clarified the matter that it came from Gray. And also the clarification was nuanced. And I think we need to leave room for nuance in this debate. And um, the clarification mm. was not that she made this up. The clarification was it's not the first time ever it is in the beginning of May and her concern remains. And that's something that we're all still trying to get the facts on. We, we still haven't seen that factually cleared up. And again, I would hate us to get stuck in this debate well malnutrition is an extremely serious issue and we know from from people like the world food program that malnutrition is undoubtedly a consequence of a lockdown in of many course, countries around the world so it is an important issue um i don't think we should get stuck on this matter what denda gray said or didn't say on it um we we must move on we must we must deal with the issue of malnutrition and take lessons from this interview let's speak about government i've got to speak to you about the minister's response and a lot of the reaction to the minister's response across the board, a lot of people viewing that as our government once again, typically refusing to be criticized. I didn't read it that way. I thought that he had the right to say his piece. Um, do we as the media then decide who's got the right to criticize? Uh, does government not have the right to counter arguments that are being put to it? I mean, we saw it as slamming Glenda Gray. I, I don't know if I agreed with that. I think that the minister is fully within his right to, to, um, to have criticized uh, Professor Gray. Um, but if you look at what subsequently happened, uh, the Minister of Health yesterday in Parliament said he... Um, he got a call from Glenda Gray, um, who said that uh, uh, she was misinterpreted or she was misunderstood or something along those lines, and they've sorted out, you know, what was between them. So my question, if, if you ask me about um, Kiza's response, my personal view on that, um, I would have expected someone in his position to do that immediately. Um, you know, that's what you do when you have a major dispute with someone important on your team, is you find them and you say, listen, what, what's up here? Um, I, I, I thought the statement um, by the minister was very harsh. It was it was hard. He was in his right to do that. I don't take that away from him. Mm. Um, but I think the language used, the way it was constructed, um, there was nothing like that 
when Professor Mahdi, who also sits on the MEC, yes. said a month ago already that the lockdown um, that the lockdown was the wrong strategy for our country. There was nothing like that when Professor Karim said in an interview a month ago that the lockdown had served its purpose and that we should get out of the lockdown. But the criticism of, of Professor Gray, I thought, was, was extremely out of, you know, it was harsh. It was, it was different to the way the Minister of Health responded. Yeah. And he obviously was upset. You know, he was upset by this and, and one cannot blame him. But, but, but then again, um, I think, you know, instead of, of having his DG then threatening her with disciplinary hearing, he could have handled it very differently, as he has subsequently. And we also saw the president, Sula Ramaphosa, saying um, in his last address to the nation, which I thought was very, very um, interesting, that, that scientists will always differ and that, that we need to appreciate that diversity in views um, on the lockdown, obviously, referring to this debate. Um, and I thought that was a very different tone than the one took by the Minister of Health. Um, AB, when you look back now, uh, what is our role as the media in clarifying confusion? Because the one thing we now know is there was confusion in the story, whether it's because people decided to pick up certain things, didn't feel she had the right to speak, whatever the reasoning is, there was confusion. Speaking to me as a journalist, even on your team, what is actually meant to be our duty when we are now caught in the middle of confusion in seeking to clarify? What do we do? I think we must continue to strive for the truth. We must we must continue to strive to get it right always. We will make mistakes again in the future, unfortunately. We are only human. Um, people we speak to will make mistakes again. Um, when that happens, we must correct it as soon as possible. We must do our best to get to close as possible to the facts and try to keep a balance um, in, in the views that we represent on our platforms. Uh, listen to and listen to government, listen to all the other players in this story. It's not going to go away soon. It's going to be with us for many more months. We're oh, probably going to have yeah. to work from our home chairs for a, a little bit more. <laughs> um, but I think I think it's a massive responsibility, Tzidi. I think um, between us in our team, we need to always make sure we, we speak to as many people as possible, um, but not be afraid to call out government when we fundamentally believe they're getting it wrong. I think that's remains a central uh, part of our role as as uh, independent journalists. And on a personal level, AB, you know, I was looking at tweets from Busani Ngaweni. Uh, he obviously was the former DDG in the presidency, speaking about his views on your opinion pieces as well. I think that's the other thing about journalism. Uh, the more senior you become, you start to opine. And no matter what you think, you'll upset somebody somewhere. And he was speaking about your opinion pieces, saying, you know, you're divisive. You seek to just divide uh the the nation or leadership what are your views about criticism and what have you decided to take to heart i think a lot of what we see on twitter is serious as john stenies and always says to me but um what have you decided to take in from all of this what are the lessons for you if you're an opinion writer and you stick out your uh your neck to take a view and nobody responds to that then you've got a problem um, so I'm not I'm not unused to criticism. It happens a lot. Um, I don't see criticism as a bad thing. I see it as a good thing. As a country, we need to debate. Um, there's not there's nothing we have to agree on the whole time. There's nothing like that. I put out my view once a week. Um, other people put out their views. We debate. We agree. We disagree sometimes. And that is perfectly normal. That's what a democracy is about. It's messy, it's hard work, but it's it's ultimately, I think, still the best system. And then I'm giving you a parting shot. I am done. I've taken a lot of my a lot of my boss's time today. Abi, when we look at the uh pandemic, we always have winners and losers. I can point at many, many, many losers in how this uh outbreak has been handled, either by government, other political leaders, or even us as citizens. When you look at it, who do you sit back and go, that's a winner. That's a person who is doing their best in this and navigating it as best as possible. But you're asking me to be divisive now, CD. <laughs> you said that's what we do. <laughs> you said that you have an opinion just so someone can catch feelings. So I dare you to be divisive. Who's done really well for you with COVID? I've said from the start that I agree with our country's approach to the outbreak of the virus in March. I don't think we had any other option but to lock down hard. I think it was the right decision. For the first three weeks, I think the extra two weeks the president needed because he just didn't have enough uh, uh, test results before him. You need test results to base those decisions on. I think the communication has been terrible. It was unnecessary. It still is unnecessary. It's something that government can still change. 
Um, I think the way the lockdown has fizzled out is unfortunate. I think um, the government needs the trust of the people. I think the the poverty, the hunger that we're seeing in poor communities, people not getting their food parcels, people not receiving their grants, is fundamentally undermining the lockdown strategy. Um, but I still support the beginning of the strategy. I think it's fizzling out now. All right, Adrian. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm actually going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for your time. That's News 24's editor-in-chief, Adrian Basson, talking to us about what it takes to put the stories out, you know, what's behind the rationale. And yes, we did discuss Professor Glenda Gray and where we stand on it uh, as News 24. Thank you again, AB. Thanks, CD. That's it from us this week. You can catch us on a number of platforms, Apple Music, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube and of course our very own website www.news24.com For News24 my name is Tidi Madia and this podcast was produced by Noctula Magnati.